Hello, good morning, good morning. How are you all doing? Good, I hope you are in this time. I hope you are all staying positive and testing negative. Amen. Uh, a little COVID joke for you. Um, I myself am having a wonderful week. Exactly seven days ago, the Los Angeles Lakers became world champions. Hey, okay. Yeah, I'm preaching in LA, okay. Uh, <laughs> And the uh, Los Angeles Clippers still have not made it to the Western Conference Finals. Amen. Um, Man, I'm I'm excited to be here with you all today. Um, Pastor Paul gave gave me an opportunity to to speak. And man, uh, gosh, today's today's one of those days. I'm I'm gonna warn you. Um, I just feel like there there are days when I come up here, man, I, I can just feel the presence of God. I feel like I'm shaking almost. It's just stepping up here, even as we were worshiping earlier. Man, wasn't that, that, wasn't that an incredible time of worship? Man, it's just the presence of God is moving. And I, I feel like even as, as I'm standing up here, as I begin to speak, I feel like you ever sit in a car or someone else's car that's a little too strong for you, or a little stronger than your car is, you know, and, and you push the gas and you're like, whoa, it's just, it's just moving a little bit. I feel like today's one of those Sundays where the presence of God, there's just an anointing that's just beginning to flow already. Pastor Dion and, and some of us were here gathered here uh, yesterday. We were praying. And one of the words that he shared, he said, you know, we're, okay, let's, let's get started. Let's pray. That's what we were saying. And he said, no, I feel like the word of the Lord is that he's already started. He's already begun. He's already moving. And we're stepping into that thing and, and just the anointing and, and the, the ease of, of, of moving into just, it's like the river of God that's already a, a current flowing through this place. I believe we're just stepping into that. Whew. So let's, let's just pray as we, as we dive in here. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for this, this time that we can gather as the body of Christ. It's just such a, a precious time. It's su- such a precious moment where we can gather together as the body and, and lift up one voice and praise you and, and worship you, O oh God, and give unto you. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for this opportunity. God, I thank you for the word that you are releasing today. <sighs> Lord, we know you're here. We know you are speaking, God. Open, open the eyes and the ears of our spirit that we might hear, that we might see you, Lord. That we might know what, what it is the spirit of the Lord is saying to the church right now, God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. I want to start this morning by asking a question. Has anyone ever lost their voice? Yeah, okay. I think it's a pretty common thing, whether, whether you're sick, you have a sore throat, you've been yelling, screaming, shouting, singing too much. I've done that a couple of times, go, go really hard in worship and just continue to sing and sing. And by the end, my voice is like this and you can't hear anything, you know? But it's, it's an uncomfortable thing to lose your voice, right? But here's the thing about losing your voice. What, what happens when you lose your voice? When do you, I guess, when do you notice that your voice is gone? Uh, un- unless, I, I, I would say, unless your, you know, uh, unless your occupation is maybe like a radio show host or what, I don't know, singer or, or, or someone else who uses their voice, maybe a preacher, someone who uses their voice on a regular basis. You know, if you're, if you're at a desk job, you're sitting at the computer working all day, there's only one or maybe a handful of times that you notice that your voice is gone. And those moments are when you meant to speak in the first place. When you're about to say something, when you pick up the phone and you realize, oh, I can't talk. So you hang up the phone, text them instead, send them an email instead. But see, there's a realization in that when you lose your voice, a lot of times the only time we realize that we don't have our voice at that moment is when we are meant to speak, when we try to raise our voice and we try to speak in the first place. If you're not saying anything, it doesn't affect you. See, and, and I want to look at it from another situation. You, you think of it, okay, as, as losing your voice. But I, I wanted to pose the question, what happens when the ones that are meant to speak, when they're meant to declare their voice suddenly?
I, I see the, the sound guy was freaking out a little bit. Don't worry, I, I switched it off. He's like, he's like looking at me. And the, the intercessor's like, oh, bo, 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 bo. Like, oh. no, 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 I, I hit the switch. What happens when, when the people who are meant to speak, who are meant to raise their voice, who are meant to be speaking in the first place, what happens when they stop speaking? What happens when their voice gets cut off? Or what happens when they just choose to be silent and no longer open their mouths? I remember there was a, an illustration that, that Pastor Paul brought up some time ago. He was, he was standing up here and, and he gave that illustration. I, I forget. He was talking about uh, speaking as well. And, and he, he took a, a pause and he just stood there for a good maybe 10 seconds. It's uncomfortable, right? It's uncomfortable because I'm up here and you're all staring at me because there's an expectation for someone to speak. There's an expectation that there's a certain voice that is supposed to be heard. And so that's, that's what I want to share with us today. That's, that's, I, I want to ease us in. That there's a, a natural thing that I, I want to look at, that the voice of, of a person, when you lose your voice, and what does that look like when you were meant to speak in the first place? I want to bring that into an understanding of a spiritual thing here that we're going to be talking about today. And that the thing that I want to declare, the, the one or two phrases here that I felt like God has been putting on my heart this week is that the church, capital C, the church, global church, has a voice. The church has a voice and the church is meant to speak. Pastor Dion mentioned this when, when he was speaking last week. He said, May, maybe in this time of, of quarantine and in, in this time of COVID and everything, in a time of crisis, the church has been deemed non-essential. There are so many gatherings and things where the church is trying to come together and it's been, it's been encountering some resistance. People are saying, you know, governments and different things are imposing that we cannot gather together and worship. And maybe that's because Maybe the church has been marked off as non-essential in a time of crisis because we have somehow lost our voice. When we've stopped speaking in the first place, everyone else in the world is looking at that thing. I don't need that. There's no point for you to gather. Someone was highlighting, highlighting yesterday that there was a, a gathering of, uh, you know, some church people were trying to gather and things, and some people were coming against that. Look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not coming against governmental institution or authority. You know, we, we take the necessary precautions to try and be, you know, in line. We're trying to keep each other's health and safety as a priority, but there's still a priority of, of the word of God tells us, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. We are still supposed to gather together. Yes, put the safety precautions in place. And I see that you're all doing that. Love because, you know, I can't see most of your faces. Y'all, white and blue masks everywhere. It's a beautiful thing. Man, but, but there, there, there's, a, there's a gravity to that. There's, there's a weight to that, a weight to the realization of have we been deemed non-essential by the world? Has the church been marked off as no longer needed? If Costco is open, but the church is not, that's got to that's got to say something to you. If you can go shopping, if you can, man, if you if you've seen any airlines, I look at some of the airlines that are packing people together. There's like no distance between anything, and look, you look at the airport; everyone is just mashed up together. When, when Sharon and I, my wife and I were traveling to, to Texas to be part of Sean Foyt's rally, the Let Us Worship rally, we were in the airport and I was like, stay away from people. <laughs> it's like, they're like, oh, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna now, now gonna be boarding group three. Would you line up, please? Da, da, da. They, they do their whole thing. And people start lining up. I was like, there's, there's no anything here. And I was like, I'm, I'm a relatively safe person. I'm trying to you know, go, go about with all these precautions here. But I'm, I'm looking at that and I'm just like, there, there's a disconnect here. There's a disconnect. between if, if we can pack a plane where I'm rubbing shoulders with some stranger and breathing the same air here, I know there's air circulation and everything in, in the filters of the plane and all of that. But I'm like, there's a disconnect. If we can pack out a plane, but we can't even gather to worship. See, the church has a voice. 
that cannot be silent, that needs to not be silent. The church has a voice and the church is meant to speak. I want to look at one, one piece of scripture here in Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3 verse 16 says right here, The Lord's voice will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people and a strong fortress for the people of Israel. That's such a powerful verse, such a powerful statement right there. If you, if you don't know, Zion is a mountain where, where the, it's denoted as the, the place of the presence of God. But it's also a picture of the modern day and of the New Testament church. So what this verse is telling us here is that the Lord roars not only from the top of a mountain, Mount Zion, but it's saying that the Lord's voice will roar from his people. The Lord's voice will roar from the church, from you and me, us as the body of Christ, as the, as the bride of Christ. We are the ones through which and from which the Lord's voice is going to be sounded. Amen? Amen. And, and this is, this is the, the, the basis point or, or the flagship scripture that, that gives us that understanding of the church's voice. It's, it's not just us as a people. It's not just us as, as our own opinions or the things that we think or, or we feel, but it's what the Lord is speaking. It's what God is speaking. When, when the voice of God is moving through his people, that is when the church has its voice. If we've been conducting it and running church and, and, and gathering together as a church, but we've lost our voice, maybe it's because we've lost sight of what God is actually speaking. Maybe we haven't been opening our ears or opening our eyes and saying, God, where are you moving? God, what are you doing? Maybe we've been too complacent with consumerism Christianity where we clock in and clock out, come into church and sit in our very comfortable seats with our air conditioning and it's a very nice room. It's a very nice building. Maybe we've been too comfortable. I believe it's, it's a season, I, I think we all understand this, it's a season where we've been more than uncomfortable in certain areas of our lives. But I believe in, in more than anything in the church, in the global church, not just here at City Blessing or in Walnut or in California, but the global church, God is beginning to shake things up. Look at that verse right there. The Lord's voice will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth will shake. There's a shaking that's taking place. I preached this when, when COVID first started, started hitting uh, the United States and started spreading everywhere in, in March. There's that verse that we were looking at that time. The things that can be shaken will be shaken. We've seen that all around. We've seen financial crisis, unemployment skyrocket. We've seen social injustice and, and economic and political turmoil and social turmoil in this nation and even nations abroad. You, we, we look at, I look at the news headlines. I see even Thailand is, is erupting in riots. There's, there's riots happening in Jakarta, Indonesia. There's all over the place, all over the world. The things that can be shaken are being shaken in this time. But we, what we do is we rest on the identity, the unshakable foundation of the revelation of who Jesus is. That is where we stand. And as things are being shaken, the, uh, the, the things that are unnecessary, I feel, are, are, are falling off. And, and God is showing what is it that we need to focus on. Let's look at one more passage here. I promise you, I'm, I'm not upset, I'm not angry, I'm just a little passionate, so at, at times if I'm yelling or, or screaming or accumulating spit in this region of my mask, uh, I do apologize, but uh, thank you for, for be, bearing with me here. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter one, um, verse four. Ooh, this is powerful. I, it's, I'm only gonna look at a, a couple passages here, so I, I want us to really focus in, really, really catch what, what God is saying here. Verse four says, then the, then the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah here. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, this is what Jeremiah says, 
He says, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. I'm too young. I'm not qualified. I don't know what to say. Verse 7 says, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Verse 8, do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, right here, this, this is the part that I want us to focus on. The Lord said to Jeremiah, he said, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. It's a powerful, powerful word. That, that phrase right there, that, that's what, what has been ringing in my head. We, we're talking about the church and the voice that the church has, that the, that the church of God, the body of Christ is meant to speak, especially in a time like this. But we're not qualified or, or we're not confident even or, or bold enough to step out until you hear a phrase like this of what God is affirming over his people, of what he's saying to his prophets and to his children. He says, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. When you are speaking, you, when you speak and declare the word of God, it's you are as speaking as the oracle of God, as the mouthpiece of God here on the earth. And it's not just your voice anymore. See, because the world doesn't want to hear your voice. I'm sorry to tell you, there's so many voices out there in society today. You look at social media and everyone wants to be an influencer. Everyone wants to say this or that or, or has, has more than enough to say about what they feel or what they think. What people need and, and want to hear, what maybe they don't even realize, but they need to hear. All of creation, Romans tells us that all of creation is yearning for the, the revealing of the children of God, of the sons of God. All of creation is waiting for us to reveal the nature of who our God is through us. And that is the voice that we go out with. When he puts your words in your mouth, his, excuse me, when he puts his words in your mouth, they will be your words in your mouth. Right? When he puts his word in your mouth, that is what gives you the authority to walk it out and to be able to speak and declare those things in the earth. The things that have already been spoken and declared in heaven are ushered into the earth through your voice, through the voice of the church. Y'all good? Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Man, I, that, that's, that's one of the, the couple phrases. I, I, I won't be too long here. Um, man, it's that, that phrase I, where I feel like God is just saying, I have put my words in your mouth. And, and not only that, I, I, I hear, I, I just heard the voice of the Lord saying, I'm coming upon you as the church. I'm coming upon you not only to put his words in your mouth, but he's coming upon you with power and with boldness. One of the, one of the, the stories or the, the characters in the Bible that I love to look at, or I, I think it just humors me, um, is, is Peter. Anybody else like Peter in the Bible? I feel like Peter is like the, the comic relief of the disciples. Like if you watch a movie and it's, it's really serious and really intense, and then they throw in that one, of the, one of those characters that makes you laugh every now and then, you know? Um, Peter is, let, let me put it this way. Um, let me bring up a couple of instances, right? So the disciples are in the boat. Jesus comes out, you know, they're, they're all afraid. Jesus comes out and they're like, Lord, if it's really you. Peter, Peter is the first one to say like, Lord, if it's you, let me come out onto the water, right? Peter's the one who walks out into the water and then what happens? He's like, he's, he's got his eyes on Jesus. He's walking on the water. He's like, whoa, this is actually happening. And then it says he, he turns his attention. He turns his focus to the wind and the waves. And then what happens? 
bloop, he goes, he goes into the water. And then all of a sudden he's, he's scrambling. He's trying to get out there and, and, um, and get afloat. And he's like, Jesus, help me. And so Jesus has to, has to pick him up and save him. There's other instances, right, where, where Jesus asks his disciples. He's sitting down there and he's like, okay, who do they say that I am? And Peter's the first one to blurt out. He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, yes, blessed are you, Peter, for this revelation came not from man, not from you, but it's like from, from God. And all of this, there's this great moment. Peter's like, yeah. You know, he's, he's all proud of himself. And then the very next paragraph, the very next thing, if you read that chapter in the Gospels, is the one where he's saying something else. Uh, he's like, oh, Jesus is like, oh, I must die because that's why, why I'm, I'm sent here on the earth. And Peter's like, nah, man, you'll never die. We'll never let anyone kill you. And Jesus goes and like, and he rebukes Peter. And he's like, get thee behind me, Satan. And Peter's like, oh, oh what did he call me? Okay, there's one or two more instances. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Uh, Jesus is being betrayed by Judas. People come and, and they're arresting Jesus. What does Peter do? Grabs a sword, cuts off the dude's ear. And Jesus is like, ah, oh, man, I got to put this back. Uh, <laughs> Peter, not again. Okay, that's not in the Bible. I don't think he picks it up. I think he just grows a new one and they like just like kick that one to the side. Like, ooh, get that out of here. And then, okay, and then the last thing, uh, Peter denies Jesus, right? How many times? No, not one time, no. Two times, no. Three times. He denies him three times. And even as he's told he's going to deny Jesus, he denies going to deny Jesus. So it's like this, this guy is like all over the place at all the time. I feel like he just, he kind of just says whatever is on his mind. And I, I like him for that reason. It's, it's funny. Uh, I, I just read the, read the stories and I think there's a bit of humor to it and where, where Peter's kind of this funny character to me. But then I look, at, I look at the gospels and I see that Peter. And then I look at the first couple, couple chapters of the book of Acts. If you read Acts 1, Acts 2, Acts 3, and you see the Peter that is in there, I'm like, this, this is a different guy. This is no blurting out, water walking, ear cutting, denying man. Like this is not the same Peter. If you read Acts chapter two and three, th there's an instance, Peter and John are walking in the streets. They're walking in the town. And, and, right, and th there's this man, he's begging. He's lame in his feet. He cannot walk. And, and he's asking, he's asking for money. He's not even asking for healing. He's saying, give me money. What would you give me? Give me alms, give, give me something, right? And what does he say? I love this part. I love this part of Acts chapter two. Peter, Peter goes to him and he says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the man starts walking. And you're like, whew, like, oh, Peter. <laughs> like, man, and, and then he goes out and he preaches, right? He begins to preach. And, and there's this whole, this whole section in Acts chapter two and into Acts, Acts chapter three of him preaching. It's Peter's sermon. And as he's preaching, how many people come into the kingdom of God? 3,000 in one day, in one message. Bro, if I preach a message and three people get saved, I am jumping for joy. If 3,000 people, we can't even fit 3,000 people in here. What does it look like when just the altar call is 3,000 people? I look at that guy and, and I'm like, man, there's something different about him. There's, there's a different boldness that came upon Peter when the Holy Spirit came. That was the key. And, and, and I look at that, man, and there's, there's even after he preaches, after, after 3,000 people come into the kingdom of God and all of that, they begin to preach the name of Jesus. They're preaching the name of Jesus in the city and they're turning the city up, upside down. That's what the, the way the, the book of Acts phrases it. The disciples and the apostles were turning the city upside down because of the name of Jesus. And, and the city authorities came to them and they said, stop, stop preaching about this Jesus. And they would arrest them. They said that they'd laid hands on them and they were trying to figure out what to do. And then they arrested them, put them in their custody. And then at some point they let them go in Acts chapter three. And what does Peter do? What does he pray for? He says, exactly right there, Marcus got it. He said, he, he, he goes, they, they gather together and the apostles pray again. And they say, Lord, I know we just got arrested and they just let us go. We got off the hook. And they told us not to preach this name of Jesus here. But Lord, give us boldness so that we may continue to preach this name. Man, that's the type of boldness that, I, that is my prayer for the church today. 
I ask God, would you give us the boldness that would come upon us, that would turn a city upside down, that would turn a state upside down. How many of you know that California needs Jesus, amen? Man, if, if we would have that type of boldness come upon the voice of the church and speak the voice of God that is roaring through the church, Amen. we would turn this place upside down. Yeah. Whew. Okay, one or, one or two more things. Um, that's Peter. I want to look at one, one more guy in the Bible that is, uh, I think is... I'm putting my own spin on this, okay? I don't, I don't think anyone will, will tell you that Peter is supposed to be looked at as the, the comic relief of the gospel. Um, but I want to look at one more guy, John the Baptist. Um, okay, one, one thing, I, let, let, me, let me preface with this. I, I grew up watching basketball, right? Uh, it's the only sport I watch. I do not play it. I'm only five foot nine. Um, yeah. I know that, okay, now I know there's some guys who play basketball and uh, more power to you. But I... I I watch basketball. I grew up watching basketball. And one of my favorite parts, I think one of the most intense parts of uh, the, like, watching the game experience when you're there in the stadium is the starting lineup, the introduction of the starting lineup. Any, what, what happened to my Lakers fans? Has anyone watch basketball? Yes, someone? Okay. And, and watch any sports of, of, of any kind, but I know this happens in basketball. So they, what they do is they introduce the starting lineup. Like who's going to be playing tonight, right? So you, you, can, you can imagine. And this is like a job that I, I wish I could have had, but I don't think I have the voice for it. I think I'd ha have to be a bit bigger and my, my voice would have to be a lot deeper. I can't, I can't even go that low. Um, but the announcer, it, it goes a little something like, uh, <clears throat> here, here we go, here we go. Let, let me give you a little demonstration. Standing, uh, and now standing at five foot two, 249 pounds coming out of Roland and then Ayala High School, Garrett Hermanos. I'm sorry, none of those statistics were realistic, but, but something like that. I, I think of those sports announcers, they're like, they're like the hype men, you know? That's what I would call the, the hype man. And see, John the Baptist, in my opinion, <laughs> is the hype man or the sports announcer of Jesus. I love reading about John the Baptist here in, in John chapter one. It's, it's not gonna be up there, but he, what does he say? He says, it says that the next day, so Jesus was, was going out into where John was preaching, right? And, and the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He doesn't describe how tall or how much Jesus weighs and all of that. But, but he, he starts to declare that. He's like, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and then we go on and, and they start talking about things. He starts, what, he starts to introduce Jesus a little bit with a little bit of different statistics. He says, there's one coming after me. This is the one that, that's coming after me. I've been talking about him. Because people were coming out to the desert to John the Baptist for a baptism of repentance, Right? And, and he would baptize them. But then they, they would ask him, are you the savior? Are you the Messiah? And he would say, no, I'm not. He said, there's one more that's coming after me who is greater than me, whose sandal straps I'm not even worthy to, to loosen. And what is he gonna do? I baptize you with water, but he's gonna baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he said, there's one more coming, coming up after me. And so when Jesus walks into the scene, there's something that stands to attention in John. He gets down in his voice and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how I imagine John talking, okay? And he does it again. It says, verse, that was 29 that I read. Verse 35, it says, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, as Jesus walked, John said, behold, the Lamb of God. Like walking, walking, walking. And Jesus like, okay, John, chill, that's enough. But like J John, John the Baptist was the hype man for Jesus. And, and and they asked him, are, are you the Messiah? He says, no. And, and, and the, the, I guess the identity of his ministry and what he was doing and who he is, I feel like this is so important for us. They asked him, who are you? He says, I'm not the Christ. And, and Luke chapter three, 
verses four to six. This is the last passage we'll, we'll take a look at. Verse four says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. I, I believe, man, his ministry was summed up right here. What was John doing? When, and, and, and the things that he was saying, he was saying, behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. I hope, I, hope you're, I hope you're catching this. I believe that this ministry that, John, that was on John the Baptist is on this generation that's here on the earth right now. There's something about this time where God is beginning to move, where God is beginning to shake things, where you can feel it in the atmosphere, that there's something charged in here, where we're getting ready for a move of God. And my life's purpose and, and what we are doing in this time and in this hour, I believe is just like John the Baptist. We are to be one. What is the voice of the church? It is to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord because the King of kings and the Lord of lords is about to show up in this place. Music team, if I could have you come back on up here. I believe that we are a generation, not, not just a certain age group. I, I keep saying this, but all of us who are here on the earth, this is a generation that is here on this planet at this time, at this hour, in such a time as this. And we are called to usher in the presence of the Lord. There's, uh, man, I believe that, that we are a John the Baptist generation, a voice crying in the wilderness because there's, we, we were talking about it a little bit and even singing about it. There's an awakening coming to this place. Not just this church, not, not, just, not just us as City Blessing Church, but I feel, man, God is moving all over the place. Look around, maybe it's not on, on mainstream media, but you look, what are other churches doing? What are other bodies, local bodies doing? People are beginning to worship, people are beginning to praise, and it's beginning to break outside of just the normal church. Praise and worship are moving out onto the streets. Praise and worship is moving into our homes, into our lives like never before. I believe that there's a great awakening, another great awakening that's coming to the land. And we are called to be the people and the voice that prays and ushers and moves that thing in. So what does our voice sound like? Yes, the voice of God roaring from Zion, but, but what does that look like? What does it sound like? What are we to do? It's simple. Our voice sounds like prayer. Our voice sounds like worship. Our voice sounds like praise. What we're doing later today, if you guys heard the announcement and if you're attending, have already gotten your tickets and everything, uh, at three o'clock, if you've registered, excuse me, at three o'clock, let it rise. We're gathering together for that very purpose so that our worship, so that our praise, so that our prayer will rise. Let that rise. Let that be the thing that rises. Let that be the thing that comes out of our mouths. He's already given us his word to be able to pray these things, to be able to praise him with the identity of who our God and who our King is. It's all in this book. He's given it to us already. He's already put his word in our mouths and it's our job to go out and speak it, to go out and to, to declare it so that the church can find its voice again. If you and I don't speak, the church does not have a voice. You are the church. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a building. It's not a, an institution. It's not just a 501c3 uh, charitable organization according to the state of California. It's you and me. 
It's the body of Christ here. And God is calling you. I believe, I believe that in this time and in this hour, what we are doing today, there's a prophetic declaration of what we are doing with Let It Rise. We are gathering together to praise and to worship and to pray. But I believe that in this hour and in this season, there's a war cry from heaven that is being sounded. There's a war cry where I believe there's a trumpet sound or something. That there's like a trumpet and a clarion sound from heaven that is being ushered and declared over the people of God. And that it's saying, rise up. God is calling you to awaken. He's calling you to awaken. The world needs to hear your voice. All of creation is longing for the revelation of the sons and daughters of God. Joel chapter 2, again, it's, it's not, not going to be on the screen, but, but Joel chapter 2 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. I believe that the church is getting its roar back. The church is getting its roar back. And it's not you, it's not me, it's not our roar or our little roar that, that we could make a little bit of noise, but it's the voice of God. It's the voice of the lion of the tribe of Judah roaring through his people, roaring through Zion. That is what we are called to do. Would you do this? Would you stand with me? I just want to pray over us. Father, we thank you for your word, God. Thank you for, for this declaration and, and this reminder even, this call to action, this battle cry that you are sounding in your church and in your body, God. That you've called us to have a voice. You've called the church to have a voice and to be able to speak. Lord, I thank you that you have already deposited your word in your people. Let it come forth now in power and in boldness like never before, God. I thank you that in this season, Lord, you are raising up a voice of the church, God, that will shake and shape a nation, Lord. God, I thank you that you are calling people into different realms in the world, oh God, whether it's, it's in the political sphere, in the economic and in business side of things, in education, oh God, in medicine, in science, in all of these different areas. Father, I thank you that you've given your people your voice, oh Lord, that you have caused us to go out and to declare your words, God, that you have put your words in our mouths and give us the boldness, God. Touch us with boldness and with power like never before in our lives, oh God, that we would go out and understand what our Father is saying. And would that be the things that we walk into, that we, we step into and that we declare here on the earth is already the sound that is in heaven. Let your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Let that be our voice and let that be our prayer, God. That what you have already willed, O oh Lord, may it be done here on the earth, God. We want to bring your will and your kingdom here into existence, here on the earth. God, I pray that you would charge your people. God, equip them to rise up, Lord, to, to raise worship, to raise prayer, to raise your praise, O oh God. To be able to come to you, O oh God, and lift those things up and begin to see you move in different situations. Begin to see you move all over our city oh god lord we even declare over the city of walnut right now father we thank you that the church oh god is getting its voice back that you are using our church and even other churches to declare the word of the lord over the city of walnut lord to be able to influence as the kingdom of god would see it fit lord send us lord we make ourselves available Use our voice, God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ooh. God bless you. Have an awesome Sunday. I know we will be back here at 3 o'clock. 
we will see many of you for Let It Rise.